All right, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Welcome to Succeed in PowerShell, Shield, Succeed in Power Shield, Optimize Career, Dash Error Action Continue. I'm not sure who came up with that. It was a mouthful. Um, I am pleased to welcome our all-female panel of technology powerhouses from Microsoft who are here to talk about navigating their careers and how we can all influence others in navigating theirs. To my left, we are so excited to welcome Aaron Chappell, the Corporate Vice President of Azure Core. Aaron, we would love to hear how you got started in tech for your career. So, um, I, the other day I spoke at an internal event uh, and uh, I was kind of a little alarmed, I would say, at the beginning of it when the gentleman introduced me as being very excited that I was there because I almost am coming up on my quarter century at Microsoft. <laughs> And I was like, thank you very much for dating me. Uh, if you could see my career slide, it has no dates on it. And part of that was on purpose. Um, but I'm embracing it now at, at this point in time. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm uh, from north of the border in Canada. Um, Woohoo. Yeah. <laughs> Canadians in the house. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because when I was going through, through uh, high school, I was just super interested in math and science and, you know, ended up my way into sort of the shop class and electronics and one thing led to another um, and, and started uh, my undergrad in electrical engineering. Um, and, you know, I, I did it just because it seemed interesting and cool and fun and I like to build things. Um, and realized, you know, when I went through that um, the field of, of electrical engineering is fascinating, right? I, I did a few internships to start with in uh, more of the hardware and, and kind of low level, um, I would say, uh, uh, programming. Um, but realized that that didn't give me the opportunity to really get out and interact with, with people as much and solve real problems. You know, they, they took, hardware takes a long time. Um, you know, to really get something into perfection. Um, and that was when I actually found my way to Microsoft. And it was, it was a really, um, in my way, compelling job description uh, that was this role of program manager at the time. And it was like, hey, you know, here you get to go and you get to meet customers and you get to hear what their challenges are and you get to solve problems and build solutions that really help them do their job and, and make their lives better. Um, and I was hooked. So I, I made my way here and, and started working in that program management team and, and really never looked back. And what I so love about technology is that it is at the foundation, right, of powering the world. If you just think about all of the ways in which you help um, those around you on your team, the businesses that you work, um, and then what the impact of that is in the world, like we really power Right? What, what happens across the world. And so that's what's led me here and, and why never, no day is ever the same and why I continue to stay. Thank you for coming. Seated next to Aaron is April Edwards, Senior Cloud Advocate and Dev DevOps Practice Lead. April, tell us about how you got started. Mine was a fluke. Uh, I've given my career story a few times. I did not plan on going into tech. I went to a high school in Kentucky, moved from the East Coast to Kentucky because my dad moved there, and I was playing basketball, and I was on my way to a basketball scholarship, and the school had a computer art, art and science program. My dad said, you know, on the intro, he's, he's like, yeah, we got to sign up for computer class, mandatory, like two years, and the principal goes, oh yeah, we've got this A-plus certification class. They build computers. My dad's like, no, she doesn't do that. Uh, so my freshman year of high school, I did the basic kind of like middle of the road computer class and I got bored. I got caught cutting class. Uh, I was a straight A student, by the way, but I was cutting class and my teacher used to punish us by tying a CRT monitor power cord to your wrist and making you do errands across the school. So my dad got the hint that maybe I was a little bored in this like typing class and I don't remember what we did. It was just like, yeah, whatever, I know how to type. My parents had computers at home. My dad just didn't think that that was what I wanted to do because he didn't get it. He didn't, my dad works in sales, so tech is not a thing for him. He um, struggles with technology massively. So I did my A-plus course at the age of 14, got certified. So when I talk to people about being in tech for 25 years, I started when I was 14 years old officially. Um, and when I graduated high school, I, I went through programming courses. 
I went through my A+, uh, MCSE as well, got certified there, and I said, I'm gonna go to college and get a degree. Now, in the US system, computer science wasn't appealing to me, I didn't wanna do it, so I was gonna tr uh, train to be a trauma surgeon, and I was doing my master's degree at Tufts University, and I needed a job, and I worked in their IT department. Part of working in the IT department at Tufts is you get free education. So I'm going, right, I need to get into med school, I'm gonna get my master's degree for free, and then I hit the age of early 20s, and I said, I've paid off all my debt working in tech. I'm not going to med school. So I stayed in tech, and it was probably the best decision I ever made, because now when I get into debt, it's self-inflicted versus <laughs> medical school. So that is how I got into tech. Thanks for that story. Um, next up, seated next to April, is Sydney Smith. Uh, we've all seen her throughout the week, but she is the program manager on the PowerShell team. And Sydney, it's your turn to tell us about your start in technology. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up um, around here in Sammamish, for those of you who are familiar with the area. So very much like tech was all around me. I was very aware of you know, Microsoft and Amazon and some of the other big companies in the area, but my parents didn't work in tech. I didn't really know anyone who worked in tech and I had zero technical hobbies, I would say. Um, growing up, spent all my time playing sports and enjoying the mountains around here and just having a lot of fun. Um, I went to undergrad um, at the Claremont Colleges and I was really interested in math, loved math, was planning on studying math. Um, econ is a big deal at that school and I was really interested in public economics, so I was like, let's do math and econ. Um, sounds good. Uh, and then my sophomore year of college, I took my first CS class and I was like, this is a lot of fun. I like actually getting to build things and see things happen. And I think kind of as Aaron was talking about, you kind of get this Im immediate feedback, which was really enticing. Um, did an internship at Microsoft um, and was really attracted to Microsoft. Um, because they offer the PM role in their internship. And also, I really wanted to come back to Seattle. That was a big, um, big thing for me. And so getting to have this like really social experience of software um, through the PM role at Microsoft and getting to sort of be an inventor um, on the small scale and be building new things. And we talk about doing things that have never been done before and the scale we kind of got to operate at was just really enticing to me. So um, from there, uh, accepted a full-time offer for Microsoft to come back, and that was, I started at Microsoft three and a half years ago. Um, and the way that the sort of university recruiting process works is, a, you know, I accepted my offer in August of 2017 for like November of 2018, right? Um, so it's, it's way in advance, and so you kind of can choose a hiring group more or less, and then like you show up on your first day and you could be working on literally anything. Um, anything at Microsoft, which is just about anything. And so um, got to my you know first day, um, was walked over to the PowerShell team, and I think it's just been an, a really amazing place to kind of grow through my like, kind of early stages of career, getting to be so involved in the PowerShell community and just like learn so much from the all of you experts, um, I think has just like really accelerated my um, enjoyment and like interaction in tech. Um, I'm gonna circle quickly back to April. April, uh, how did you get started at Microsoft? By accident, as usual <laughs> in my life. Um, <laughs> there is a theme in my life. Um, I actually had a career conversation with someone today. She's like, what's your plan? I'm like, I don't have one. Um, you know, I think doors open. So I was living in the US, and for those of you that saw my keynote on Monday, I moved to the UK about nine, nine and a half years ago. Um, before I moved to the UK, I was working for an MSP out of Boston. I worked for a company in Colorado. I needed a life change. I went to England. And I had always assumed when you work at Microsoft, you need to live in Redmond. That was kind of always in my brain. Um, and I just, I never connected the dots. And I'll be honest, my dad was, again, the not techie, was like, you should go work for like another company, not them. Uh, but he didn't understand it. So when I moved to the UK, uh, this cloud thing started taking off. I was very involved with Office at that time, Office 365 migrations. Uh, I was a consultant. I worked for a few MSPs in the UK, and I started doing this thing in the cloud called Azure. And I was like, oh, I really like this thing. Um, and I started getting good at it, and I decided in my career that I needed to focus on Azure and the cloud. I thought, that's the way forward. It's where I want to go. I love data center transformations. I'm going to go Azure all the way, and I'm going to start working on more code. I applied for a role at Microsoft. I went to the final stages and got declined for the role. 
because apparently I didn't fit the role. I was like, okay. So I went and got another job for a company. Four months in, I get a call from Microsoft and they're like, yeah, we want to hire you. And I'm like, cool. I didn't put in my resume. I didn't think the role was right for me. They also had my wrong resume. So they had the wrong name because I'd gotten married. I had changed jobs and they're like, yeah, we don't care. Just come in. Okay. So I got fast tracked to the final interviews. I did about three hours of interviews and got brought in um, and got hired. So I didn't even submit a resume. They had the wrong name and they didn't have my latest job spec from the last like seven months. And here I am today. Awesome. Thank you. Um, here at PowerShell Summit, we have a class called the on-ramp class. And I believe some of them are in the audience today. Does anybody want to raise your hand if you're in the uh, on-ramp class? Uh, the on-ramp program is a week-long introduction to IT and PowerShell for people who may just be getting started with their careers. Um, Aaron, what d advice do you have for these folks as they get started with their careers? So I have two pieces of advice. So I'm going to give you one for free. Um, <laughs> I have the, to pay for the other one? The first is, well, one with the price <laughs> of admission, right? So, okay. um, so the, the first thing I will say is say yes to everything. Um, you know, I think that, you know, in some sense, there's some parallels, right, in the, in the conversations that you've heard from April and Sydney, in the sense of, like, you never know where something's going to lead. And you never know if you like something unless you try it. And so, you know, I think there have been many times where I have looked at something and went, hmm, I don't know. Um, but I sort of have this, this mantra in my approach to things, which is everything is an opportunity until it's not. Um, the trick is figuring out when it is not the opportunity. But like you, saying yes to everything, it opens doors, right? It creates connections, it creates relationships, it creates experiences. And in many ways, your entire career is just, you know, I like to think of myself as an experience collector, right? I, it's all about how many different things have I had some amount of experience in before so that when I come into some new situation, I'm just like, oh, it's like a little bit of that and a little bit of that and at least I have somewhere to start and I'm not starting with this blank slate. And so first, I think my biggest advice would be just say yes to everything. Uh, you don't have to say yes twice. If you've already done it, you know you don't like it. But say yes because that builds that foundation. Um, and then the second thing you know, I think you've already started to do, which is coming to events like this and starting to really meet your community. Um, because we talk about kind of navigating your career and we talk about how the role of mentors in your life and the role of people who sponsor the work that you do. Um, I think that's all great and fine. But I will say for me, some of the most powerful people in my life are the peers that I have. They're the people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis, right? They're my network. They're the people when something's going bad, I pick up the phone and I go, help, right? And, and that community, and that's one of the things why I've always loved the PowerShell technology as a whole and the PowerShell community is you just see that, right? You see that in the community, people willing to help, people willing to, you know, help you learn something new or give you, you know, start with, you know, putting a script out there, hey, build, start from this, or yeah, I've done that before. Um, and so the more that you have these connections that you develop through networks like this, for me, walking back, it's my first sort of conference after the last two years. Uh, and so this has a special place, right, in terms, and I said yes, because I knew there would be many faces when I walked in that I hadn't seen in a long time um, that have been part of the community for a really long time. And the, the fact that people will invest in that and invest in each other, I think is just so great. Um, so don't take, you know, don't miss up those opportunities to really meet somebody and build those connections because you never know, right? You never know, right, in that whole network what's going to pull you back in some way or what is going to create that next opportunity. Thanks for that advice, and I, I completely agree with you because I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't do the same. So um, my next question is from John, and I'm gonna invite John to come up and... So I'm a dad of two kids. My daughter's six, my son's three, um, and I really wanna give back, right? So my first question is, as a, as a dad, but also as an individual contributor to the PowerShell community, how do I give back with serving um, underprivileged youth, uh, women in IT. And then my second question is, how do I foster um, discoverability, uh, excitement in my kid? Because PowerShell has little, literally changed my life. So yeah, those are my two questions. I'm gonna go sit over there and listen. The first one is, you know, 
I do a lot of funding with Girls Who Code. They, the reason why I've chosen them as a charity is because they're global. I sit in the UK, a lot of us sit in the US, um, but I would say get involved with your kids' schools and go to the areas where people don't want to go. At Microsoft, we offer funding to those areas, so like get connected in, offer your t volunteer time. I get five volunteer days a year as a Microsoft employee. Volunteer your time, and with your kids, um, never tell them no. I mean, like discipline them, but my, <laughs> you know, as, as someone who's been in tech and played sports like Sydney, my parents never told me I was a girl and couldn't do something. Um, no was not a thing, and I was just treated. You want to go play football with the boys? Go play football. You get your face smashed up, but go play football. You know, I played ice hockey, I played soccer, I played basketball, and they never told me I couldn't do anything, regardless of gender or anything, and that was empowering. My mom had a phrase: um, "Never color in the lines," and she taught that to my nine-year-old stepdaughter. And my stepdaughter's very literal, smart kid, but she's like, "Oh, I have to color in the lines." And my mom's like, "Megan." don't color the lines. You don't have to color in the lines. And I think with kids, no matter what, just don't tell them no and always encourage them to take that shot. Because like Aaron said, I have walked through so many doors. I wouldn't be sitting here today in front of you all amazing folks had I not taken just a, a I stepped out of my comfort zone and said, you know, I'm going to go do this thing. What's the worst that can happen? Because failure isn't failure to me. I'm learning a life lesson and I'm building that experience. So pick myself up, find a new open door and keep going. You know, I think one of the other things I will, you know, build on on top of that is that, um, you know, I have spent, uh, I would say, my career building women's communities, you know, and women's communities and expanding to just how do you create more inclusion and space for, you know, anyone to bring their full selves to what they're doing. Um, and, you know, I, I, I got depressed one day because, you know, we're trying to build more women in, in the industry, you know, um, and... You know, we, we focus a lot on how we, you know, when they, when folks come in from college, how do we create, create the support path? Um, and I was back doing, uh, you know, some work with my alma mater. And um, they do these sort of science and technology camps for grades like three, four, five, <laughs> um, when they, you know, are in sort of elementary school. And it was really scary to see the statistics because, Grade three was 50-50, girls and boys. Grade four was 50-50, uh, boys and girls. Grade five was 80-20, boys and girls. And so like something happens, right, at that point in time. And, and, and I often do this, this, this talk of like, and you can do it, do it on your laptop, do it on your phone, like pull it up, pull up Google, pull up Bing, and type in like elementary school teacher. And like look at the image gallery. It's all women. Right? And so there are these unconscious biases that we have and lack of role models that no one is doing on purpose. Like nobody's sitting there going like, we're gonna like, you know, indoctrinate or, or lead people to think that they should go into a path in this career or not. But they are just infused in the society that we have. So I think the best thing you can do with your young girl um, is to show her role models, right? Of great women who are doing um, you know, things in, in the world uh, who are involved in technology, right? I think that was why it was such a great moment. It's not technology related, but a great moment to see, you know, a, a woman as vice president of this country um, in the last year because it starts to break those boundaries. So please go, like, challenge those things. And if, and, and, and the first step of that is just being aware of it. Because, like, and it's interesting because I, I love this concept of the unconscious bias that we have because it's not just as, as men we have unconscious bias, it's as humans we have unconscious bias. And so, like, my unconscious biases towards other women are the same as the ones that you all might have. And so, like, you just have to get curious and really create that space. And so please, like, find those things. Um, you know, find ways that connect them. That would be one. Um, the second thing is that, you know, I really think that as, as I'm going to be very stereotypical in some sense, but as, as women, the thing that many women connect with as their girls and going in is helping and giving back. And so the more stories you can tell about how technology is an enabler to unlock things in the world, Right? I love the fact that we're at this place now where every company is becoming a technology company. Because, you know, as a doctor, you talked about wanting to go, as a doctor, you can help the patients you have. As someone working on medical technology, 
you can help the world. You just think about stories that exist today around the vaccine development that's happened in the last couple of years. Um, and so again, finding ways to really sort of unlock that and, and, and take interest in what do they like, right? If they really like the idea of doctor, or they like, you know, um, you know, sports, like talk about how technology is helping athletes, talk about, or talk about how technology is like changing the world, and those are the ways I think that you get them interested. You gotta meet them where they are in terms of what they're interested in, but show them that there are more doors um, that you can open. The only thing that I would probably add is that, you know, we do have an involvement with Tech, tech Impact for the on-ramp program, and that would probably be a good opportunity for you to get involved with, uh, you know, bringing more people into tech. Um, my next question is for Sydney. Um, how did you know that technology is what you wanted to do? Like, what was your defining moment? Oh, wow, that's a good question. What was the defining moment? I don't think that there is, you know, one defining moment to immediately go against the question. Um, but I think it's just like kind of like little bit by little bit. Like, there's like these little opportunities sort of along the way. Um, kind of like what Aaron was just talking about. It's just like saying yes to like one one more thing and trying out one more thing um, and really building building on that. And I think for me, joining the PowerShell team and um, really like connecting with the open source community and seeing firsthand the impact of the things that we were doing and shipping and the decisions that we were making with the community and how like far reaching that was um, was a huge moment for me. I was like, wow, this is really cool. And I feel like I could, we could go really far with this. Um, so I think it's, it's the combination of like sort of getting that quick feedback, the like sort of social aspect of it. Um, the, the fact that we're all like a PowerShell community together was a real turning point for me, like, um, less interested in, in building something, you know, on my own and much more interested in sort of using this network of people, um, to, to build things. And then, yeah, just the, the impact I think that you can that we can have with PowerShell is so huge. I mean, when, we all know that like once you start automating things and all these things, um, the the acceleration is just sort of exponential. Um, and so getting to see that impact firsthand, I think, was a moment for me where I was like, okay, like you know, maybe after college, it's like maybe let's do try this thing for a couple of years and see how we're how we're liking it, and then shift. But I think the more time I've spent in it, the more I'm like, this is really cool. And I feel like we do really have like an involved and kind of awesome and a little bit like unusual PowerShell community and like events like this really help to bring it all together. My next question is for Aaron. Uh, what steps have you consciously taken to advance your career? So that's an interesting question for me because, um, you know, I, I talked about being at Microsoft for almost a quarter of a century and in that, whole time I have only on my own accord changed jobs twice. Oh wow. Um, every other change in my career was a reorganization. <laughs> and it was like, hello, you're doing this. Why don't you do this? Um, and so in many ways you could say, well, my career was, uh, you know, uh, happened to me in some sense. Um, that's not entirely fair, I think, because, you know, in many ways it's like every day that you show up, if you show up in a way that expresses who you are and what you're capable of and what you want to do, then I think people around you recognize you and recognize that and, and, and sort of, uh, uh, support, but I, you know, I think for me, it's always I didn't have some master plan, right? When I walked through the door on the first day at Microsoft, that I wanted to be a corporate vice president at Microsoft, and in fact, uh, my husband will remind me. Remember that day you said you didn't want it, like you're done, like you don't want to do anymore. Um, and you know, but but the thing that continues to to make me. Um, want to continue is two things, right? It's, it's the people that I work with and the people that I work around. Um, and if I can do things to create an environment that makes it easier for other people to do their job, then, and easier for us to accomplish our goals, then that's a good day. Um, and so that motivates me a lot in what I do. Um, and the second is, the, back to you know, what Sydney's saying, the work that we do. Um, and so the more that I can get really just energized around the potential of the work that we're, that we're, that we're doing is, is the thing that motivates me. Um, and I'm looking and I'm always seeking to say, okay, well, how can I help? How can I solve that problem in, for a larger number of people? And um, you know, that's, I think what's really led me to Azure. Uh, if you just think about 
Azure as a whole, we're really about powering the world's workloads, right? We're about, it, it's a weird thing. I work on a product that in many ways, if I'm super successful, I'm invisible because it, you know, I'm just there for customers and I'm there so that they can consume. So you can spend the time on what it is that's most important to you and your business and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but there's so much that goes into that. And so that, that like, that's a really hard problem to me. And so for me, it's you know, the focus on the people I'm working with, the focus on the end customer and what I want to Im and what I want to impact, and then the, the broad impact as a whole um, that really lead me and motivate me to just take on you know bigger and bigger and things. And my next question for April is kind of similar, like along those same lines of, um, do you own your career or does your career own you? And I think I had like two motivations for this particular question. And Aaron kind of spoke to the first one, which was like, how, what was your career pro progression like? But then it's more of like, does your career own you? So I own my career. Um, that was part of my conscious decision of moving to England. Um, I get like five weeks of vacation a year. So it's taught me to take time off. Um, and I lived in a culture in the US where I was expected to work 70 hours a week. I hated my manager, I hated my job, but I still love the tech. And I'm like, there is something better out there. Um, I, when I started Microsoft, I was like, I love Azure, I want to help people. And I love going into customers and saying, we have this technology in Azure and I'm going to help you make your life better. We're going to write some code, we're going to redo your apps, it's going to be amazing. And people always said, I love your passion for the tech. And I've kind of kept that, that's how I've harnessed my career. And as I've kind of gone on in my career, I didn't actually choose to be an advocate, it fell into my lap. You talk about open doors and career progression. I was like, wow, I love hel helping people. Oh, I got invited onto the show. Oh my God, 50,000 people saw this. 50,000 people cared what I had to say. That was mind blowing. And then that went off in a very exponential direction. And I've taken the open doors. I've taken the opportunities and I let myself ride this wave that I'm in love with. I love helping people. I love it when you all come up to me and ask me questions. Like I will field any question. And and I do make sure to balance out my life. Like I love tech and I love writing code in the evenings, but I love my time away from work. So I've set up boundaries around my work. Um, for those of you that have the unfortunate event of following me on Twitter, you're gonna see a lot of triathlon posts because I do triathlon <laughs> in my spare time. Yeah, I'm probably a little crazy for that, but that's my mental release. And that actually helps me focus. Those long runs, those long rides, those long swims are crazy, but it's how I get my focus. That's how I write my talks, that's how I, Think of a really hard problem trying to solve. So I have absolutely controlled when I work, how I work, but I allow myself to ride that wave. And if it's too much, I say no, but I pretty much say yes to everything. And then I say, you know what, this door is closed and moving on. And I allow myself to do that. And I allow myself to take the next steps. This next question is directed to anyone who wants to take it. Um, one of our most popular topics that we talk about a lot here is about imposter syndrome. Uh, at one time or another, we've even heard Jeffrey Snover talk about it. How do you deal with or overcome imposter syndrome? I can take a first stab at this one and then let y'all go for it as well. So I think... I was just going to say that is a very non-imposter syndrome <laughs> approach to answering a question about imposter syndrome. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, yeah, so I think first, right, on an, like, an individual level, like how do I handle imposter syndrome? I think I had imposter syndrome you know, sit when I found out I was going to be on this panel and I was texting my friends about who the other panelists were and I was like, ooh, not sure, not sure if I belong, you know, but, but also acknowledging that like, yeah, I don't have all the answers, but I do have my like lived experience that I can share on this panel. But I think in general, like on an individual level, it's like, for me, I just try and, you know, make sure I'm toggling into that like learning mindset, right? Like if it is true that I am the stupidest person in the room like all what an exciting room for me to be in and like learn so much from and so like I think approaching that with with honesty and you know seeing seeing the upside of what I don't know is like huge opportunities for learning um but I guess like similarly like right like who's ever had imposter syndrome you're gonna raise a hands right so like if everybody in the room has their hands raised like probably not a me individual problem like probably a system problem right like, so how can we look at this from sort of like more of a systems approach? And I think that's where I put on my open source maintainer hat or community member hat. Um, and that's a question, that, that's the question, I think the question that like keeps me up at night is like, how do we create psychological safety in open source and in our communities? 
Um, and I think a big part of that and something we talk about as a team is how do we, how do we you know, sort of handle that imposter syndrome together so that like folks are, feel welcome to you know, open an issue in the repo or make the contribution um, before they feel like an expert because we all know that that like, never really comes. And I think the thing that we talk about is you know, sort of approaching with honesty and curiosity about what we would know and don't know and are curious about and sort of approaching that with kindness, but like certainly don't have all the answers on how to solve like imposter syndrome all up, but like very excited if somebody does, <laughs> because that is a, something I think about a lot. Um, someone once said, I think imposter syndrome spouts all the fact that the more we know, the, the more we realize how much we don't know on a topic. And I was always scared to write a blog or to do a thing, because I'm like, they're gonna find out how much I don't know about this. But what I found is when I write about a topic that solves a problem, other people have that same problem. And I'm like, oh, and that's where my love and passion for technology comes in. So I had to kind of like take that leap of faith and I'm gonna write a blog. And I remember I wrote a blog and someone's like, I read your blog on blah, blah, blah. You did? I was at a customer site. Like, oh yeah, it was great. It was simple, but I took that learner's mindset and said, this is how I learned it. And they absolutely were able to adapt to it. And so I think I face it every single day. I'm constantly learning new tech and I'm willing to learn that new tech and I'm willing to say, I haven't a clue. Um, and, and fostering that behavior in that environment, I'm very fortunate to be on a team. And I will say at Microsoft, every single team I've been on at Microsoft, my managers have said, we have a learning mentality. And I talked about in the keynote, growth mindset. So fostering that within your teams, like there's always gonna be someone that knows more than you in that room. Always. And there's always going to be someone that thinks they know more than you, but they don't. Um, so that's the kind of the fun one. So I think just, yeah, getting out there and having that growth mindset and being willing to learn because, you know, that's what we're here for. So I'll, I'll start by sharing just a, uh, this whole thing on imposter syndrome made me think of, and there's a lot of things on the internet that are kind of cruel and evil, but one of the most cruel and evil things I saw in the last year was this billboard at a conference that said, like, imposter syndrome, maybe it is you. And I was just like, no, that was just really low <laughs> in some sense. Um, but it shows you, if somebody's gonna go put that up in the thing, how much it actually is an issue with all, with, uh, with all of us in terms of what we face. Um, you know, my answer is simple. I I'm really good at talking to myself. Um, and so, like, I, I, I like to talk to myself. And so when that voice in my head starts talking to me, right, you know, I get that mail from a very important person and I'm like, oh, I don't want to open that. Like, they're going to tell me that I'm an idiot or, like, they're going to, I don't know. I, like, it's in my head. I'm making up this whole story. Like, I talk back. Um, and, you know, I'm good at doing that in a faster way. And so I don't think it ever goes away. I think you just get... Um, better at, at being able to quiet, right, that, that other side of your voice um, and move through it. And the more reps that you do, the easier it becomes. And then the imposter syndrome, um, you know, the, the smaller things go away and they just, it shows up in the bigger things and then, it, you know, that's a harder conversation, but you just get better and better at it. So I'm good at talking to myself. <laughs> I didn't want to admit that out loud that I talked to myself as well. Like I have the little <laughs> demon over here that's like, you can't do this. And this one's like, you got this. So yeah, I talked to myself as well. <clears throat> well, I mean, you saw the look on my face when I came upstairs and you're like, are you okay? And I'm like, mm. so I empathize with you because I am up here with all of you <laughs> and I'm having a little bit of it myself. We're just um, people. We don't bite. I know, but it's been a lot of fun prepping for this with you. So, um, my last planned question is for Sydney. Um, how do you get involved and stay connected with your professional network and your community? Ooh, okay. Um, so I think that there are like a, a whole bunch of things that come to mind. So I'll, I'll just kind of start going down the list and we'll see what sticks. Um, but I think the first thing that came to mind, comes to mind for me, it was like, that was a big question for me, I think coming to a huge company like Microsoft. Um, so many of my um, friends or people I knew in college were going into like the finance or consulting or they were going to grad school and they were going to be in this cohort and they were going to know all these people and they were going to be their friends for the rest of their lives. And I was like, that's awesome. Um, at Microsoft, um, it's a really big company. You don't have, you don't know everybody who graduated the same year as you and starts. Everybody's sort of off on their own teams. And so when I got to Microsoft, I was kind of like, 
where where are my people? You know, where where are all these other people that must be just like me? I know that our like incoming um, classes are like uh, very diverse. I think some of like the the most diverse demographics at the company are like the, the new hires sort of each year um, as we kind of build that. And so I was like, you know, where are my other like young woman in this company? Where are my other people that are having the same questions as me and struggling? Like, how do I meet them and network them? So I started like sort of asking that question to like everyone who would listen to me and then they'd kind of be like, oh, that's actually a good question. Why don't you go talk to this person and then to this person and then to this person and eventually got connected with somebody who could actually help me solve the problem. Um, and start an early in career program for Azure um, so that we could start to build that kind of network. And I spent my first two and a half years at Microsoft working really closely with building that program up to the point where they hired real staff to run it. And so it wasn't just me and my few friends um, and that sort of thing. So I think like asking the question and like following wherever it goes until somebody tells you, <laughs> you know, either either sponsors you for it or um, you figure out that it's not an option. So I think that that's one way I've built a network and connected is just like admitted that I was something I was looking for and didn't know how to find. Um, I think the other the other way is like things that I like to do or I'm interested in, like playing on Microsoft soccer team and then we play other companies and sort of like getting to know people through things that I care about. Um, in within my team, getting to know people just by like being my goofy self um, and uh, getting the feedback when people when people appreciate that. And then I guess like you know the bigger question, right, is like coming to conferences, talking to all of you, engaging with you in our community call and in an open source and sort of like the external community, sort of that way. So there's like I, the kind of different spheres that I think about when I think about like building that kind of like community or network. Anyone else? I just want to say one thing, which is um, I think it can be hard and sometimes intimidating to think about how you engage in ways like that if you are naturally more introverted. Um, and I suspect everybody is kind of going through a little bit of the last two years of being in more isolation and then figuring out, well, I, like, do I even want to walk into a room like this? I was at one of our first events a couple weeks ago and uh, a colleague confided in me. He's like, yeah, I was sitting in the parking lot and I, you know, I was like, if I just went home, nobody would have missed me. It would have been okay. Um, and, and yet he would have missed out on an opportunity as well. And so, you know, I do think that knowing yourself and knowing what, means are the things that draw and give you energy and taking care of yourself so that if coming to something like this takes a lot out of you, like how do you recharge during the day and you know get your 15 minutes up in your hotel room where you're not talking to anybody or whatnot? Or, you know, is it easier for you to engage in, you know, some online community where you can, you know, think about what you want to do and put out a request and have a different or is it easier to do in smaller groups? And you know, so like maybe your goal is to come such something like this and meet five people that you're gonna have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with when you go back to whatever your job is. So, like, don't think about it having to be, you know, all or nothing in some sense. Um, I think if it's authentic to who you are, that you're going to have more impact and it's going to have more lasting impact for you. Um, I do a lot of work with the MVPs, the Microsoft MVPs in the UK. How many MVPs are in the room? Good amount. Um, the UK and EMEA, Europe, have the highest percentage of uh, Microsoft MVPs in the world. So geographically, I'm really close to them. And when I post something on Twitter or whatever, they all promote it. And I was like, oh, OK. So I do engage with them regularly. Um, I'm part of an Azure cloud native user group based out of the UK, but we kind of push it globally. And I want to give back to the community. Because having been on the outside of Microsoft, I have complete empathy. I mean, you both started Microsoft like right out of school, where I was, I was on the outside. Like, I worked my day job. And I had other things to do at night. Like, I didn't get learning time at my job. I had to spend my evenings learning PowerShell, learning how to do all these things and learning the cloud. Take my Microsoft certifications. Oh my God, I have so many certifications. Those are my evenings and weekends. So when I have been at Microsoft, I'm like, I get what it's like to be out there and be normal. I think when you're in Microsoft, you're in this bubble in a good way, but just, you know, I have that empathy. So when I work with the MVPs, they sit there and they spend their evenings doing stuff in Azure, their side projects. And I'm like, how do you guys have this energy? But they're so supportive of each other. They're so positive and my respect for that. So I, I talk to them regularly. I, I will put feedback out on LinkedIn or Twitter. I think a lot of you saw my post about those of you that are under the age of 25 learning PowerShell, how would you do it? Why? Because I'm not 25 and I need to know how the kids these days learn PowerShell. 
because we are, my colleague Pierre and I are, are, are creating content for them that they want to see. And as all of us here have learned PowerShells in very different PowerShell in different ways, we learned it our way, but I need to know how other people learn it because it, what worked for me didn't. So I do a lot of work with the community. I'm very fortunate to sit in the geographic location and really supportive people. And I just, you know, I support them. They support the heck out of me. And I try to go to all the events. I join MVP calls. Um, and I think it's awesome. I think it's really cool to see that involvement. And I think that goes back to John's question a little bit of how do we get these, these younger kids engaged and, and involved as well. Um, at this point, I- TikTok. Yeah, you and I have talked is about Jason that. Is Jason Helmick in the, in the he room? He is. <laughs> Jason Helmick will be doing TikTok videos soon to, <laughs> to, uh, to involve the younger people of the community. Uh, no joke. He's going to be doing it. We look forward to seeing your TikTok channel. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Yes, Pierre. So you've talked about... Uh, being owned and owning your careers, ways to encourage uh, the younger generations to come into tech and all of that. Once they're in, and I look around, and I'm looking at ratios here, and it's not as it should be, what can we do to be better allies? This is gonna be controversial, uh, but I like being controversial. Um, I, I, I am involved in a culture right now that is different than the one I grew up in, and a lot of women stay at home when they have children. Um, the, you brought it up. Uh, a lot of girls by the age of 12 decide to do unicorns, rainbows, not tech, not STEM, um, because it's what their friends do. And for us that are in tech, you know, unfortunately, genetic, uh, you know, as a gender, I have to carry a child. I can't give it to my spouse, unfortunately. Um, I, I've chosen to not have children, but I think there's a lot of, I work with a lot of people in the UK where it's still part of the culture. The women stay home with the children. I have a few female friends that are high powered execs of very large companies and their husbands stay at home. And I think as a culture, we have a bit of a toxic thing about I'm the man and I will go to work. I will put food on the table and I love that. But I'm also saying, well, I'm the woman. I'm gonna put food on the table, why don't you stay home with the kids? Be the stay at home dog father, you know, or whatever. I think there's a bit of a societal thing and as a woman, you know, I have not had children, I can't comment, but from the mothers I know, they're, they're very attached to their kids and very protective, but I think it takes a real man to step up and say, you know what, I'm gonna raise the kids and, and maybe a little bit of role reversal. So I know that's a little bit controversial, but it's okay as a man to say, my wife is stronger than me, she's the backbone, and maybe you help more with the family. Allow the women to go back to work, go back to school and get involved. Um, I've, had, I've been at a women in tech conference where the woman said, my husband requires me to do the household duties. I'm not allowed to write a blog. And I, I didn't know what to say with her. My honest advice was, leave the bastard. Um, <laughs> I was politely or a little bit earlier in my career and said, you know what, do the housework, find time for you, carve out that time. And I'll say that to all of you sitting here, find time for you every day in self care. You know, go get a massage. Pierre got a manicure the other day. Um, you know, do the things for you, but also allow your spouse, promote them, whether they're male, female, alien, whatever, promote your partner and allow them to, to do the things they want to achieve as well. Quick thing to that um, before. Aaron goes, um, but I think it's also like, like similarly, like, yeah, like also take the time for yourself, like lead by example in that way, right? Like take the parental leave. Um, if you're, if you're the father, like take advantage of those things as well as uh, assuming that they are available to you. Um, because it, uh, it levels the playing field a little bit when, when everyone's taking time off and everyone's participating in the childcare duties, everyone's participating in the household duties and those sorts of things. So I'll say something that may be controversial, building on top of that, which is, like, I don't think it needs to be an either or. And so for me, you know, what's really important is that, you know, my husband and I are equally involved in what's doing. And, and so I, I really do think there is that place where you've got to look at it and say, you know, what is the work of the family? and how are we going to divide that responsibility? Um, and I, I know I'm in a more privileged position, but like, what am I gonna outsource? 
um, because uh, and I like I mean one of the best tips that I had from somebody at one point in time was like you know my housekeeper comes like the day before garbage and so like they put the garbage out at the end when they leave the house and I'm like that is brilliant like all these life hacks in some sense in terms of what you do so I would say I, I think it needs to be a partnership in some sense um, but you know that is sort of the family unit that deals with but I think when you're with when you're in the workplace um, you know, I, I, first of all, I, I really appreciate the question because I think the question, that's what starts it all, right? The fact that you're curious. Um, and for me, it's two things. It's curiosity, right? When you see someone who is not like you in some way, like genuinely being empathetic and showing up and being curious about what their experience is like. Um, and that takes courage because I will tell you what ends up happening is you're gonna get into a messy conversation. You're gonna get into a conversation where maybe you ask a question and you, maybe you put your foot in your mouth. And, and I'm gonna tell you from the other side, I would much rather have someone with genuine interest in me put their foot in their mouth and open up a dialogue that we can then learn together than to not even ask that question. So I would say, please be courageous, ask that question, show up. Maybe it isn't the most politically correct thing for you to say, but if you do it with, with genuineness and you do it with empathy and you're doing it to truly understand how you might be able to help, right? I think you're gonna see that the other person will receive it in, in a way. And, and it's been, I mean, those have been, some of my most closest allies today are people who ask me a really stupid question. But it opened the door for us to have a very meaningful conversation that shifted both of our perspectives. Because you know, I, I learn every day as well. And on that note, I think we are out of time. Uh, I want to say thank you, everyone, for coming and talking with us. And I really appreciate your time. <laughs>